Hello again, everybody. Uh, for those of you who didn't see me a few hours ago I was talking about the deep lens, I'm here again to talk to you about DevOps for startups. Uh, my name is Jeremy Edberg, and uh, I'm currently the CEO and founder of a company called MinOps. Uh, before that, I worked at SRE at Netflix, and uh, first SRE at Reddit, too. So I've been doing DevOps for a while, and I'm here today to talk to you about doing DevOps for a startup, because that's what I do now. I run a startup, and I do DevOps for it. This is on, this is not on. There we go. So the guiding principle here is if it won't scale, it'll fail, right? The key to scaling is to finding the bottlenecks uh, before your users do. So why am I here? Uh, I am here so that you can learn from my mistakes because why should we learn from other people's mistakes? Well, because it's easier than making them for yourselves. So hopefully you will learn from a few of my own mistakes uh, so that uh, you don't have to make them yourself. Uh, by the end of this 30 minutes, I hope that you will take away things about uh, like infrastructure as code is a good idea and about microservices and serverless, which you've heard about earlier today. Uh, I'm gonna touch a little bit on um, queuing theory and some chaos and logging and incident reviews, maybe, depending on how, much, how quickly this goes. So I wanna start with some uh, infrastructure as code uh, infrastructure of, is, as code is this idea that everything you do with your infrastructure is done uh, in your code, so you manage it like you manage your code with check-ins and accountability and traceability and easily managed, resources are easily managed. Uh, it enables continuous deployment and continuous delivery, things like that. And so, uh, and, and you can easily test uh, server deployments and solutions. There is, of course, challenges to infrastructure as code. So, uh, you know, you can lose track of things. Uh, there's always gonna be that one machine that you just want to do something separate with or something like that. Uh, and then there's some people who just fear automation. So they just don't feel like they're in control if their infrastructure is completely automated. You should get over that fear if you have that. Uh, so I believe in automate all the things. Uh, I use a lot of cloud formation. I use it for application startup and configuration and deployment. Uh, everything basically is in CloudFormation. So this is the CloudFormation dashboard for my company. How many are familiar with CloudFormation? Use CloudFormation? Awesome, most of you. So uh, CloudFormation basically is a way for you to define what your Amazon infrastructure should look like. Uh, you run the system, it builds an infrastructure that matches. Uh, we use uh, CloudFormation for everything. Uh, even like little things like this, uh, creating a single role uh, in CloudTrail and activating it, we'll do it all in CloudFormation uh, so that it can be repeated. So if I have to spin up a new account uh, or if something happens and I have to do it again or I wanna do it in dev and as well as prod, I can do it easily by using CloudFormation. And so uh, this is from a, a company that I've helped with before called Armory and uh, this is their stages of development. Uh, and I really like this chart because it really describes where everybody is. Uh, and so, you know, you could be like traditional deployments where you're deploying iron and that's down at stage one. Uh, you could be all the way up at stage five, like uh, where, where Netflix is trying to be. They're not even there yet. Uh, you know, automated deployments, automated testing, everything is automatic. All you do is you check in your code and production manages itself magically. Uh, but stage, stage three is roughly, I think, where I try to be as a startup and where I recommend other startups aim for, where you do some continuous delivery, but maybe you still have some manual processes, and that's okay, because you probably don't have the resources to automate everything. So a big question that comes up often is monorepo or microservices? Which one should I use if I'm just starting out? So let me talk a little bit about each and then, and then I'll tell you my feelings on the subject. Uh, so some advantages to the mono repo uh, is this idea that uh, you don't have to worry about dependencies because it's all just there. Uh, you don't have to worry, account for data movement because you're just running one big service in one place. Uh, deployments are really simple. You just deploy your one piece of code uh, and coordination is really easy because it's all in that one place and you're all working on one repository and everybody is working in one place at the same time, and it's all deploying at once. And then there's microservices, right? This idea that you have lots of small little services, which is nice if you have small teams, 
uh, especially if you're a distributed workforce. <clears throat> it's nice that uh, you can have a small team over here work on this part, and a small team over here work on this part, and they don't have to necessarily talk to each other or be in the same time zone or anything like that. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, so some advantages to the uh, service-oriented architecture are things like uh, auto-scaling uh, and capacity planning and things like that. Um, local caching can be more efficient that way. Uh, you can narrow in the effects of change and it's easier to find bugs sometimes uh, because you can say, well, I just deployed this one particular service and everything broke, so everything's probably there. Another nice thing is this idea of being uh, highly aligned and loosely coupled. So the idea that the API is, is how everything communicates. So if you don't like to talk to other people, you don't have to, you just publish an API and say, this is how you talk to my service, <clears throat> and that's all you need to know. And it works really well if you have these small distributed teams, uh, teams in different parts of the world, things like that, because then you just, you have the API, and the API is the API, and sometimes you might need to change it, but at least, you know, that's, and you can communicate about that. Uh, but with this uh, idea that the two go hand in hand, so distributed workforce works well with microservices, uh, and nowadays, especially with uh, the wages in the Bay Area, uh, it's a lot easier to have a distributed workforce because you can actually hire talented people and not pay through the nose for them. <clears throat> so if we're talking about a proper microservices architecture, this is, in my mind, what the proper microservices architecture is. It has all of these various components to it. And what's interesting is if you talk to mature companies that are doing microservices, they're spending like 25% of their engineering effort on building those services. Uh, they're either spending, every engineer is spending like a quarter of their time just dealing with the platform, or they have a quarter of their engineers dedicated to nothing but the platform. And, and building these things is hard, right? It's, it's, uh, it's not easy to do, and once you, you've got something that works well enough, you stop. You don't keep going, you don't keep adding functionality to it, you just want it there because it's not your core business. So, what do we do about that? Uh, well, I'll get back to that in a second, but I wanna take a quick backtrack to talking about what infrastructure should you run your startup on and keep that other part in mind. So, uh, you know, back in the day we had physical servers, then there was virtual servers, and then containers, uh, now they're serverless, uh, and you heard about serverless earlier, uh, so I don't have to tell you the advantages of serverless, uh, other than, uh, you know, the cost and things like that. So physical services, there is, you know, there's mostly disadvantages to them, uh, and at this point, if you're a startup, unless you have a very specific need, uh, it would be foolish of you to be doing physical servers. Uh, so, you know, if I'm helping a startup out and they're telling me about physical servers, I tell them the first thing they need to do is, is get some a better infrastructure. Uh, virtual machines are still, you know, pretty popular. It's, it's nice, you can, make, you can make prod immutable, you can still do rapid iteration. Uh, it's polyglot friendly, so lots of different languages. It only takes a few minutes to deploy a new virtual server. So virtual servers are still a good way to go, pre-baked AMIs, that kind of thing. Uh, and then there's containers. So containers is a nice happy medium there between virtual servers and serverless. Uh, where test and prod can be the same and you can deploy them very rapidly uh, and there's lots of good tools for that. Uh, high multi-tenancy, still polyglot friendly, deploys in seconds, can live for hours. Uh, and then there's at the highest end of the stack, there's serverless. So there's this, it's the smallest unit of compute, you can't really get much smaller than serverless. Uh, you can, they're super scalable, very rapid iteration, uh, very polyglot friendly as long as you have a platform that supports the language you want to use. Uh, it makes it easier to collaborate because you're just doing tiny little functions uh, and they generally only live for seconds. And there's a whole lot of choices out there, right? There's not just Amazon Lambda. First of all, Amazon has a bunch of things uh, that they offer for serverless. Uh, you know, their very first service ever uh, was SQS, which was basically a serverless service. Uh, and then there's other stuff out there too from other companies that can do things like resize images or, or build static websites or whatever. And by doing serverless, you can uh, combine them all together. Uh, so, you know, there's Lambda, there's SNS, S3. These are all basically serverless things. Uh, and so, for those who don't know, 
Serverless still means servers. It's just not managed by you. It's managed by someone else. And that's really key when you are a startup. Anything that you can get to do, have somebody else do it is gonna be an advantage. So serverless computing is basically all about uh, speeding up your development by getting rid of the overhead. Uh, now, there is some overhead to serverless, but it definitely helps to get rid of a lot of the overhead of managing servers. Uh, as you can see, I'm a big fan of serverless. Uh, our whole company is run on serverless for the most part. We have a container or two here and there. Um, basically, you have to choose what infrastructure you want to use, right? Do you use VMs, where it's the whole machine is your unit of scale, or do you want containers, where it's just the OS level, or, or do you want to go serverless, where you're really just dealing with code? And in my mind, uh, VMs are for when you want to deal with things like networking and OS level stuff, kernel tuning. Uh, containers are great for I want to run applications. Uh, and containers, in my mind, are for software you didn't write. So software that you bought. And when I say bought, I also include open source things that you buy for zero dollars. But basically anything you didn't write, containers are great for that. Because uh, they tend to not be written for serverless. But any code that you do write, it's really helpful if you go straight for serverless. Uh, at least that's what we did uh, <coughs> for scalability. So serverless is nice because of all of the uh, functionality you get out of serverless, uh, like being able to uh, do, uh, <coughs> to be, you know, all that stuff is managed for you. Check in your code, it runs. So what do all the parts of, ser my, of microservices have in common? Servers, right? Uh, and when you're dealing with servers, you have to deal with all of these things like patches and access control uh, and all of that stuff. And so one of the nice, another big advantage to serverless is this idea of all of that stuff going away. Somebody's taking care of all of that for you. So I'm really push for uh, serverless if you're gonna do, if you're a startup. Uh, now there are some disadvantages to serverless, uh, which I'll talk about in a little bit. But if you're doing serverless, another nice thing is when you're running your proper microservices architecture, a whole bunch of it just goes away because it's all taken care of for you by your provider. Uh, you also get a nice little, uh, a nice little security benefit uh, since your con the containers that your code is running on, because serverless is really just someone else managing very rapidly deploying containers underneath, uh, they'll only last for a few seconds. And so you get a nice little security advantage because even if someone can compromise you, uh, it, they only have a few seconds to do what they are gonna do. That doesn't mean it gives you perfect security, but it helps. So the nice, you know, other nice things about serverless is you can trigger it. I don't have to tell you more because you heard more about it, so I'll just keep going on. But uh, basically, the nice thing about Lambda is that it lets you manage all of your stuff in the same place. So it lets your developers manage their code and your infrastructure in the same place. And if you're a DevOps person, or uh, this is probably where you're turning your head out, your hair out, because you're saying, oh my God, my developers are gonna manage the infrastructure. Uh, and that's true, that is one of the disadvantages of serverless is that your developers are basically have a lot of control over the infrastructure. Uh, and anything that you do with serverless is gonna be, your problems are multiplied by 10x. Uh, because everything is going away so rapidly, coming in so rapidly, uh, there's so much data moving back and forth, the services are so small, all of those problems with microservices are gonna be 10 times worse uh, when you're doing serverless. So you're gonna have to deal with that, right? You're gonna have to deal with efficiency, efficient dependency usage, local dev environments, this is basically an unsolved problem. There's, there's some so things there that help, but it's still really hard to sort of develop locally and figure out how exactly it's gonna work up when you deploy it. Uh, making sure everyone is deploying with the same dependencies in each of their serverless functions. And there's definitely platforms out there like serverless that help you take care of a lot of that stuff for you. Uh, but so a lot of these are, are still problems with serverless. So where does that leave us? Uh, serverless or containers, mono repo or, 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 uh, server or microservices. So like I said before, I think that serverless is for any code that you write and containers are great for any code that you acquire or buy. So uh, I think a good startup infrastructure is a hybrid between, uh, server, uh, between containers and serverless. Uh, and recently I've heard Amazon refer to Fargate as serverless containers. 
Uh, I think of it more as just a container management, but sort of if you combine that with Lambda, you get a good infrastructure that you don't have to put a lot of effort into managing. Uh, so that's really good if you're a startup. And then as far as the microservices or monorepo, there's really no good answer to that, right? Is the monorepo, you're definitely gonna get off the ground faster. You're gonna get your stuff in front of people faster. Uh, and if you're a startup, getting your stuff in front of people is, is probably a really good way to go. But at the same time, if you wanna use serverless and let someone manage all of your infrastructure, you pretty much have to use microservices, which means you're gonna have to put in some effort into at least a little bit of a platform, a little bit of figuring out uh, you know, how does this code talk to this code, and uh, who, how are we gonna move data back and forth, uh, how are we gonna manage users, and all of that stuff. So, <clears throat> once we've got our proper microservices architecture, we want to at least have some basic monitoring. Uh, this is actually some graphs from uh, an old, some old Reddit graphs. Uh, and what you see here is that uh, there was a drop in network, and a drop in response time, <laughs> or uh, successful responses. But the problem is we have no idea why, right? This monitoring does not tell us that. Uh, we can look at some other graphs, so here are some other graphs from the time, uh, and if we look at all of these graphs put together, uh, we can say, oh, it was probably due to CPU, no, CPU went down, like what exactly caused it? You can start looking, you can see the kind of everything lines up, but we still don't really know why. We can start to make some correlations in our head. But what we really want is a monitoring system that does that for us. So uh, this one, for example, is a, is, a, is a screenshot from the Netflix open source monitoring system called Atlas. Uh, and what's nice about it is the blue line is uh, the actual metric, the red line is the predicted, what it should be, uh, and the green bars represent alerts, basically. It represents the derivative of the two put together. And so you can create an alert on the green bars. So anytime there's a green bar, then there's an alert. So this is an actionable metric, right? This is a correlation. This is something you can actually take action on. Uh, you can say that the prediction and the actual don't match, so we better go look into it. Uh, with the right graphs and the right data, it'll actually tell you uh, what went wrong. And so that brings us to choosing a metric. How do we choose the right metric to monitor? Uh, the first one is self-service key. So the best person to know which metrics to monitor are the people who wrote the software. So you ideally wanna have a monitoring system that allows developers themselves to put the metrics into the monitoring system. So that your developers can say, this is important, this is important, put graphs in there. Uh, and ideally, it's done in such a way where other people can use those graphs. So, you know, we've had uh, situations in Netflix, especially where uh, I, when my service was failing, I wanted to know about the API services metrics because I want to know what kind of data is coming at me, that kind of things. So I was able to build graphs using both my data and theirs. Uh, another really important tip is that you want to alert on an increase in, of failure, not a lack of success, especially if you are uh, doing microservices. Uh, there's lots of situations where you will have a lack of success that aren't necessarily bad. For example, if you're deploying a new version of code, you're gonna shift traffic away from an old version that might still be running. Uh, that lack of success isn't necessarily bad. Uh, so it's very important to alert on uh, increases of failure. Uh, there was this one time at Netflix where uh, the traffic all of a sudden dropped off and we were getting alerts like crazy. And it was only happening in Latin America and we couldn't figure out why. We started diving in all the infrastructure, uh, and then I eventually flipped over to CNN to see if there was any sort of like major news event, uh, and it turned out that there was a Mexico versus Brazil soccer game. So nobody was watching Netflix because they were all watching soccer. If we had been alerting on a la increase of failure, we wouldn't have gotten all those alerts because there was no increase of failure. There was simply people watching less Netflix. Uh, so to, how many people does this have meaning Oh, one, all right, excellent. So what do I mean by P50, 90, 99? These are percentiles. So this, if you look at this graph right here, uh, the blue line at the bottom represents the P50, so 50th percentile. Half the users are getting a response rate as good as that, and half are getting worse. 
Uh, and so for, if you look at that line, everything looks great. And even if you look at the 90th percentile line, the green one right above it, things look, still look pretty good. Response times in general are pretty good. But if you look at the 99th percentile, all of a sudden things don't look so good. Uh, people are getting really terrible long response times up to a minute. So you have to ask yourself for every metric, which one is the most important for your business? So this is where knowing your business ties into your operations. Uh, especially when you're a startup, your business and your operations are very intertwined. Even when you're a big company, they are, but especially at the startup level. Uh, sometimes it might be okay for 1% of your users to have a terrible experience. Uh, sometimes it's not okay. So you have to know which metric do you actually want to look at. Do you want to always be looking at the 99th percentile? No. Do you want to be looking at 50th? Probably not. So you have to find the right percentile to be looking at. You also need a monitoring system that supports percentiles. <coughs> Uh, another important thing, uh, especially when you're a startup, is to do as much immutable data as possible. Uh, anything that you can write that's immutable is a good thing to write in a way that's immutable uh, because it will help you with your scaling and your, your disaster recovery later. Uh, the more data you, ha and it will help you with your caching especially. Uh, because moving data is the biggest cost you're gonna bear in a distributed system. Uh, and the more immutable data you have, the less data you have to move around for cache and validations and things of that nature. Uh, so, you know, cache and validation is a very hard problem, and if you have immutable data, then uh, you don't have to worry about it as much. Uh, so, you know, you still do have to move data around, though, and you want reliability, and so you want to use queues as often as possible. And so the question is, which is better, queues or sliced bread? I would say it's queues. Here's a quick example. Uh, when you uh, look at this graph, this is a graph of queue depth. So first of all, by using queues, you get a lot of great insight into data moving around your system. Uh, and so you want to look at your queue depth. Uh, when you look at this, you can tell that something went wrong around second 10 or 11, but you don't really know what. So uh, if you take nothing else from this talk, take a cumulative flow diagram, uh, this is basically this idea that if you graph the arrivals in a constantly counting up and the departures, now you can immediately see what happened to this queue. You can see that things were not being processed fast enough, so they were not leaving the queue quickly enough. Uh, and so this cumulative flow diagram just told you where your problem was. Also, by monitoring your queues, you can take advantage of this theory that um, capacity utilization increases your queuing exponentially. Uh, so what you can do is if you have a very flat line on your queue, you can start removing infrastructure. And when you get to the point where your queue depth gets exponential, that's where you've reached your, your limit of capacity. And that's where you add just a little bit more capacity back, and then you'll be good to go until your queue depth hits ex exponential again. Uh, variability, however, uh, increases the, uh, uh, there's a price to variability. Uh, and it increases your queue depth, and you need to have larger queues to handle it. Uh, there's uh, ways around various methods of handling queue depth. So uh, you can have one queue for every server. Uh, you can have one queue that serves all the servers. Uh, and then there's, uh, you know, this is where queuing theory comes in. So if you have the thing on the right, you can have a, what's called the stuck head problem. So if you have a slow request at the front, it's gonna block everyone behind it so no one will be able to get out to the other servers. Uh, if you do uh, that system there where you divide it up across the servers, then you can also have that same problem where one slow request is gonna get stuck in the beginning of every queue and slow everything down. Uh, one way that we got around this at Reddit uh, was we actually monitored average response times. So this is where we were looking at 90th percentile response times on every API request and the queue that you would go into was based on how fast each request was. So fast requests all went to one queue, slow to a different one. And so then we could avoid the blocked head problem because we would have slow requests going to a set of servers that are just for slow requests, and so most things were fast, and as a bonus, we could look at what was slow, and we could say, okay, what can we do to speed up those particular requests if there were a lot of them? So uh, it gave us some nice insight, and it gave most users a good experience because most of them were getting a fast response. So understanding some very basic queuing theory will help you a lot if you can just do some basic stuff like dividing up your requests like this. 
Uh, and then uh, one more thing I want to touch on is chaos engineering. This idea that uh, you simulate things that go wrong and find what's different. As a startup, I would say the two most important things to be testing are instance loss and increased latency. Uh, instance loss is actually fairly easy to test for. You basically just destroy machines and see what happens. Uh, Netflix does this in production all the time. And at the beginning, it was a big problem. And now nobody even notices, because everyone knows it's coming. And so they write their software to just deal with that. Uh, latency is much harder to test especially because there's no good answer to what is slow. Uh, certain requests will be, at certain speeds, will be slow or quick, depending on your needs. So part of testing latency is testing where each service's threshold is for latency, slow or fast. Uh, and then the last thing I want to touch on is uh, incident reviews and the importance of a good incident review. You don't want to be in a situation uh, where incident reviews are used to place blame or to dock pay or bonuses. I've been in that situation before. You want it to be a collaborative effort. You want to ask what's wrong. You want to try to get to find out a whole class of problems you can solve with a particular problem uh, or with a, that a particular incident has highlighted instead of just that individual incident. Uh, and so incident reviews are a good time to use for uh, finding what behaviors might, you might want to change and how your testing missed this kind of thing. What testing could you have done to handle this uh, instead of, you know, what could we have done to test ahead of time to find this? So I've touched on all of these things, uh, except the log suck part, but you can talk to me about that after if you want. Uh, and um, so hopefully you've had some quick takeaways, and if you're a startup, you maybe learned a thing or two about ways to run uh, startup infrastructure. Uh, if you want to find me, that's all my contact info, and I believe I am now out of time. So thank you all very much for coming, and hopefully you got something out of it.